Well, let me wish you a good evening as we have come together once again on this first day of the week to worship the Lord. And uh, at this point, at this moment, I'm going to be uh, preaching a message to you as you're accustomed to. And uh, sometimes when we get into the, the rhythm of doing something, we can kind of go through the motions or if not go through the motions, not really think about why it is that somebody is doing it something. Like, for example, when I got up here, probably no one thought, well, why is Micah getting up there? You know why. Because I'm delivering a message, because I'm preaching. And yet, even in me doing this very simple thing, uh, I think it's good to remind ourselves why I'm up here more than just I'm preaching. There is a need for the Word of God. And I am... Uh, trying to deliver to you in such a way that you will be understanding and that you can apply it to your lives and that you can be pleasing to the Lord. And that's, that's why we have uh, this message. That's why we have this portion of the service uh, in our Sunday uh, morning and Sunday evening services. And so just kind of a reminder of what I'm doing up here, why I'm up here. And, and I hope that, uh, of course, it's always beneficial to you. I appreciate Amos' prayer just a moment ago asking on my behalf that I uh, do well with the material that I've put together. And uh, I appreciate anybody who prays for me on, on, on that behalf or just the work I do in general for uh, me and Chelsea and, and I, Adeline as well. Your prayers are very much coveted and appreciated. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon for a kingship to begin with a military, a military campaign of conquest. For example, one that we see in scriptures would be that of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar took uh, his, his father's throne at about 605 B.C. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar starts uh, rampaging through the Middle East. And one of the uh, places that he ends up hitting is the nation of Judah at that time. After he is... Uh, after Assyria has been taken care of and dealt with and all of, that, all of that, he begins and he deals with Judah, at least in part. Egypt is also in, in his sights at this time. And for years to come, Nebuchadnezzar would go around conquering places and putting places that were already in Babylon subjection, keeping them in that subjection. Another example, we would see this from outside of the scriptures, though referenced to in scriptures to some extent in the book of Daniel, would be the conquest of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great took his father's throne when he was very young, but uh, by the time that he was uh, no more than a young man, he had conquered a great portion of the world, and that came through his military conquest that he uh, began as he took the throne. And so with this custom in mind, I want to submit to you that Jesus is another person. Uh, person is not really the right word there, but you get the idea. He himself, when he took the throne, I want to suggest to you that he also went on a campaign of conquest. And I'd like to show you through the scriptures that that took place. And so we want to begin by pulling on a thread of passages. First, turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 31 in just a moment. Remember the context, though, that Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream and no one could foretell, no one could tell. The interpretation because, well, for one, Nebuchadnezzar would not give them the dream itself. He would not tell them the dream, but even if he told them the dream, no one could give the interpretation because that belonged to God. But Daniel comes in and he gives the interpretation of this dream. And first, Daniel tells him what the dream is, starting in verse 31. He says, you, O king, were looking... And behold, there was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly 
and its, uh, and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we, now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom, God, who, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. And as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with the common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and pot, partly of pottery, pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong, and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So, Daniel unpacks this dream of Nebuchadnezzar's. And in it we see the future of the world laid out for about the next thousand years, give or take. First, we read of Babylon. And Babylon is a great kingdom, but after Babylon will come another great kingdom. Lesser, according to what Daniel says, but still a great kingdom, the Medo-Persians. And then after that, the kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth, the kingdom of Greece. And then we have this kingdom of iron that cr crushes and shatters all things, but also it has some potter's clay mixed into it. And so it's partly strong and partly weak and mixed in together. And that is the kingdom of Rome. And it says in verse 44, in the days of those kings, in the days of the Romans... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will last forever. Now, we know this kingdom to be the church. God set up the church during the time of the Roman empires. That is the kingdom that was set up on earth, never to be destroyed. But we still have yet to be introduced to its king, in a sense. That comes in Daniel chapter 7. Turn with me over there to Daniel chapter 7. As we're pulling on this thread of passages, as you look at the Bible almost as a, as a tapestry, we're just looking at one thread that we can pull on and see some of these things being laid out before us. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, Daniel is having a vision and he says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. 
You notice that language there at the end, his kingdom will not be destroyed. Same language as Daniel chapter 2. But we see one like the Son of Man coming up before the Ancient of Days. We talked about this morning in Bible class that the Ancient of Days is the Father. He's the one sitting on the throne. And the one like a Son of Man coming up to him is Jesus. Now, in this vision, as Daniel is telling it, the one like a son of man, you're not supposed to think of them as, as some kind of uh, deity. No, one like a son of man is someone having a human form. And that is who is receiving this glory, dominion, and a kingdom from the ancient of days. And yet, we often think of the son of man as deity, as Jesus. Well, why is that? Because Jesus, when he comes, keeps calling himself... The Son of Man. Look at Luke 19 for just a moment. Luke 19. Starting in verse 5. Luke 19 starting in verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here is just one instance of Jesus calling himself the Son of Man. And every time he calls himself the Son of Man, he is referencing himself back to Daniel chapter 7. Matthew chapter 24 and, and uh, other passages where Jesus talks about the Son of Man coming with the clouds. Again, that same imagery is used in Daniel chapter 7. And remember what Jesus taught as he began his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that kingdom is coming, and he is identifying himself as the Son of Man, the one who went up to the Ancient of Days and received glory, dominion, and a kingdom, that kingdom that would never be destroyed. I would submit to you that the Bible seems to suggest that the point at which he walks up, goes up to the Ancient of Days and receives that glory, dominion, and a kingdom is when he ascended on high. Another thread that we need to, or another part of the same thread, is in Acts chapter 2. And I find myself quoting this passage more and more often these days. Because it is just so key to everything that we believe as Christians. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 29, we're starting in the middle of Peter's sermon. But he says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he knew, or because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did he, his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter makes the point that it had been predicted and the prophets, and David was one of the prophets, who said that there was going to be a descendant of David who would sit on the throne and would be granted rule, and that this person would neither be abandoned to Hades nor 
his flesh suffered decay. I was speaking about Jesus. Jesus who died on the cross. Jesus who was raised from the dead. But also, as we just saw in the previous chapter, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascended into heaven. And it says here, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There are other passages that we could read tonight that tell us that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down on a throne. He is receiving rule and power. And here we see the kingdom coming into play, the church coming into play at, at Pentecost, where the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved in Acts 2 and verse 47. And so Jesus has received His rule. He has received His kingdom. The kingdom is set up in the time of the Romans. But now, it is time for Jesus to conquer. Because His kingdom was not just going to be in Jerusalem, not in Judea, but in the whole world. And this was foretold. Jesus is going to conquer through the gospel. Jesus foretold this in Matthew chapter 24. Turn over there with me. Matthew chapter 24. And verse 14. Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. We're not going to talk about that phrase, then the end will come. That's kind of out of the scope of our study this evening. But it is an interesting phrase. But he says the gospel shall be preached in the whole world. And what is that gospel called? The gospel of the kingdom. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And look at verse 6. Right before Jesus ascended. It says of the apostles, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. What's interesting about this is that Jesus actually kind of does answer their question, but not in the way that they were expecting and, and certainly not in a direct way. They say, Lord, is it at this time you were restoring the kingdom to Israel? They, they still don't even understand the nature of the kingdom. They don't understand what's going on. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. Here's what's going to happen in a few days. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. And what they don't realize is that that's a function of the kingdom. They are going to be his ministers, his witnesses, and they are going to go out and conquer through the gospel. And we see this throughout the rest of the book of Acts. For example, in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. And the name Jesus Christ. They were being baptized men and women alike. Philip was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God, and he's preaching in Samaria at this time. And then we go to the end of the book, Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28 and verse 23. Acts 28, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 23. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers. Now this is talking about Jews in, in Rome that Paul had wanted to speak to. And it goes on to say, And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God 
and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. Now skip down to verse 30. In verse 30 it says, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness <coughs> unhindered. In both of the passages that we just read, there is some pairing going on. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, they believe Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Here in these two passages in Acts 28, he's, he's solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God, trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. And then in verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus. The kingdom and Jesus go hand in hand because the kingdom is the Lord's and Jesus is the king. And I would suggest to you that with this preaching of the gospel that is going forth into all nations, that Jesus is conquering. Look with me in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. There are two statements here that we want to look at from the Apostle Paul. Verse 13, notice what it says. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Now He there is talking about the Father and the beloved Son there is talking about Jesus. So He rescued us from the domain of darkness. He transferred us into the Son's kingdom. Now, some would say that the kingdom is not here. Some would say that we're still waiting for the kingdom, that it's going to come at some point at the, at the end of tribulation and Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years in Jerusalem. Well, Paul is talking in about 60 AD to these Colossians and he's saying, you're in the kingdom. You've been transferred into the kingdom. The kingdom had already existed for about 30 years at this point. But continue reading with me in verse 23. In verse 23, Paul says, If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. 30 years after the church had been established. 30 years after the apostles had been sent out, and I realize it's not a, an exact 30 years, but approximately 30 years after the apostles had been sent out, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. Paul is saying that's exactly what was done. The gospel had been spread to all creation, all creatures under heaven. And so Jesus' conquest indeed has been and will continue to be a total conquest. Jesus has conquered the world. He has overcome the world through the gospel. And as Christians, we are living in a victorious kingdom. Now, that does not mean our work is done. There is, is still more to conquer in a sense, but in a sense, it all, the gospel has indeed spread into all the world. And we have to keep fighting. We have to keep being good soldiers for Christ Jesus. Well, we talked about how Jesus conquers. He conquers through the gospel. But let's talk a moment for about who He is conquering. And also a little bit of why He is conquering. Jesus is conquering his enemies. And you might think, well, duh. Well, yes, that's an obvious thing to think of. That's, 
And when you go out and conquer, you don't conquer your friends, do you? No, you conquer those who are opposed to you. And yes, Jesus is conquering those who are opposed to Him. Staying in the book of Colossians, let's look at verse 15. In verse 15 of Colossians chapter 2, excuse me, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. This is what it says of Jesus. When He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. All the rulers and authorities had been disarmed. They had been made a public display because Jesus, because the Lord, God, had triumphed over them. And when we look at this idea of Jesus conquering, Jesus triumphing over people, I want to take us back to Daniel chapter 5. I want to take us back to Daniel chapter 5. Because I think this picture of Belshazzar that we have in Daniel chapter 5 actually applies far more than just to Belshazzar. Starting in verse 18, Daniel is speaking to Belshazzar here as the, they've had their party and the writing has been made on the wall and Daniel's giving a little bit of a history lesson. Daniel chapter 5, verse 18. O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. And whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beasts. And his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking from him. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath, and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Mean, mean, tekel, you parson. This is the interpretation of the message. Mean. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. A lot of people, when they summarize what that writing on the wall meant. It goes something like this. You have been weighed, you have been numbered, and you have been found wanting. And that applied to Belshazzar, yes. But all the kings of the earth, every kingdom that has ever existed, every citizen, every person on this earth, We have been weighed, we have been numbered, and we have been found wanting. And God has taken rule out of our hands, out of any king's hands, and He has given it over to His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is 
rolling over his enemies, conquering them one by one by one, to the point that one day in judgment, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that is the picture that we get of Jesus. Just as Belshazzar had been weighed and numbered, found wanting, his kingdom was going to be taken from him and divided, the Medes and the Persians were coming. They were about to, to walk into town. Literally walk in. No, no resistance whatsoever. And that's kind of the picture of Jesus too. Because He's so powerful that He can just walk in. And He can conquer anyone who opposes Him with ease. Consider this verse as well. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 20. Paul says here, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ at His coming. And then comes the end. When He hands over the kingdom to the God and Father. When He has abolished all rule and authority and power. For He must reign until He has put all en His enemies under His feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So we're told that Christ's reign will have an end. At least in a sense. Because He is reigning until He has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Until He has put all of His enemies under His feet. Conquered them. Crushed them. And we're told that the last enemy to be abolished is death. And that's going to happen in the resurrection. But I hope I've given you a little bit of an appreciation for this imagery in Scripture of Jesus the conquering King. And I would be remiss to talk about this subject without reading this last verse. Revelation chapter 19. There are many images of Jesus that we think about and we see. Certainly we think and see, think about and see in our mind's eye the man on the cross who is bleeding, with a crown of thorns, with nails in his hands and his feet, and agonizing pain. Yes, we see that image of Jesus. But don't forget this image of Jesus as well. Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he, will tre and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the image of Jesus that is presented up to us 
very close to the end of scriptures. And perhaps it is the, the last image that we should see. This conquering king on his white horse, he goes out, he fights, and then of course, in the next few chapters, he is sitting on that great throne judging the nations as well. Jesus is a conquering king. But he has conquered the world in a way that no other king has. Through love, through grace, through self-sacrifice. And yet he is mightier than ever. Mightier than anyone. And I suppose the lesson that we should get from tonight is that we should not stand in his way. Because it is futile. And along with that lesson of we should not stand in, a, in his way is that we should be on his side. Because if he's out there fighting for me, if he's fighting my battles that I can't fight, if he's willing to cast down enemies on my behalf, Why wouldn't I sign up for that? And Jesus is a king that will fight battles on your behalf. And that should be a humbling thing. Because he is king of kings, lord of lords. He has all power, all authority, all majesty, all dominion, all glory. And yet he's willing to think about you. And he died for you. So this evening... If you have not pledged your loyalty to Jesus, if you have not <coughs> believed in Him, that He is the Christ, that He is the Son of God, if you have not repented of your sins, if you haven't confessed Him before men, if you have not been baptized in His name, what are you waiting for? If you are a Christian, and for a moment your lo loyalty has wavered, for a moment you thought about going and joining his enemies. Don't do it. It would be the most foolish decision you could ever make. And if you have committed some kind of sin against him, some sin against the Lord, there is time to make it right. Because not only is he great and powerful and mighty, but he's also forgiving and gracious and loving. And he's willing to forgive you and willing to welcome you back into the fold. So if you have any need this evening, won't you come while we stand and sing?